And it is immediately following a really famous um, conversation in which um, Jesus is describing himself as the shepherd who protects the sheep from the wolves. And this is important, I think, for us to understand as we enter into our scripture this morning, why the urgency and the desperateness of knowing if Jesus was, in fact, their Messiah. At that time, the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else. And no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. This morning's message title is Borrowed Without Permission from an adorable children's book by P.D. Eastman titled, Are You My Mother?, To offer some context for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this famous text, I thought I would share an official version of the book's description. When a mother's bird's egg starts to jump, she hurries off to make sure she has something for the little one to eat. But as soon as she's gone, out pops the baby bird. He immediately sets off to find his mother but not knowing what she looks like makes it a challenge. The little hatchling is determined to find his mother, even after meeting a kitten, a hen, a dog, and a snort. (laughs) Can you tell it's a Dr. Seuss type book? (laughs) The adoption of this book's title for today's message is clever to me for two reasons. The first is the obvious connection with today being the secular observance of Mother's Day. The second being a subtler, more thematic connection between a bird searching for his mother in the book and a people searching for their Messiah in our scripture. Though we witness the stories parallel in a common search for someone they could not visually identify, The two narratives diverge as the baby bird is reconciled to his biological mother and the religious people questioning their Messiah lose faith and walk away. Unfortunate for those of us here this morning, we will need to focus on the story with the least happiest ending, an exchange between religious leaders and a previously undercover Messiah that even after a verbal affirmation remains an unclaimed reality in their visceral spiritual quest. The scripture begins. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. While a children's story book ending with a baby bird's rejection of the mother he had just spent 12 pages searching for would read both traumatic and heartbreaking. Ending any dialogue between Jesus and the religious insiders in this manner has become both predictable and unremarkable. Jesus answers those who had gathered there, saying to them, I did tell you, but you didn't believe me. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. Like many other mothers with school-aged children living in this area, 
the steady drum of life's rhythm was drowned out by the notification on Tuesday afternoon that a shooting had taken place at the STEM school in Highlands Ranch. Located less than 10 minutes from the unfolding of yet another national tragedy, my daughter's school immediately went on lockdown as authorities televised their concern that a third shooter may still be on the loose. The uncertainty of these circumstances resulted in my daughter's school advising parents to refrain from coming to the school to pick up our children until the situation at STEM was reported as under control. As a notably creative and slightly neurotic parent, I decided that I would drive to the school and wait across the street so that I could be right there when the children were finally released, which inevitably would be much later than the normal time of their normal departure. Upon my arrival at my undercover mother parking spot, directly across the school's property, my cell phone rang, my daughter's face popping up on my screen, screen. Mama, I want to come home. I began to offer words of assurance compiled from my memories of cheesy sitcoms and lousy parenting books I never managed to read all the way through. Then a few minutes in, she abruptly asked me to hold on. Swishing and static, muffled voices, three loud bangs in the background. My heart rising to my throat. With such intensity, I am now convinced of the definite possibility of a person choking to death on their love for another human being. Then, her voice again, slightly irritated for the unsolicited interruption in our call. Sorry, Mama, that was Jack. (laughs) This week, and honestly, many weeks before this, The frantic search to identify a qualified candidate to serve as a messiah is ridiculously relatable. My sheep, Jesus says, my sheep, they listen to my voice, and I know them. For wherever I am, and whatever I look like, and whatever clothes I wear, or language I speak, or skin color I have, whether I am the breeze, or the passing wind, or the touch, of a stranger's embrace. They follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I know the fear felt when the wolf's eyes glow in the darkness, and I know the dull, fantastical desperation for some giant holy hand to descend from the sky and swat all these unidentified wolves far, far away. This week, perhaps more than other weeks, I crave the fulfillment of an imagery of Jesus sheltering us from the wolves. The illusion of an immunity from their ability to shapeshift into the most secure segments of our secular life. The escape of an exemption from their capacity to convert into chameleons in a culture barely aware to the danger we once thought as hibernating in a history we had evolved beyond. My first image of the suspected adult male shooter arrived Wednesday via the local news coverage of his first court appearance. Whatever Silent presumptions contributed to my mental sketch of a murderer were erased by the involuntary compassion I felt for the skinny young boy who sat shackled and shaking, eyes hidden under the safety of his hair. When the hunt was over and the lights turned on, The raging wolf of my imagination was cowered in a corner, shaking and starving. Then Jesus said to them, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand, for I and the Father are one. 
Perhaps the weakness of the religious insiders is our unpreparedness to hear a message we ourselves would not prepare. And the words I would write on behalf of Jesus would clearly create a divided line for those who deserve to belong and for those who do not. My sense of safety and security in this world actually depend on the presence of these categories, the deepening of our divides. And yet we open our eyes to see that the world is not what we are prepared to accept. Reflecting on the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone National Park in 1966, author and environmental campaigner George Monbet observed that the reintroduction of wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. A case study he uses to support a wider proposal of a process newly defined as rewilding, a process in which native species, previously eradicated by human or environmental influences, are supported and reintroduced so that all may thrive. A process dependent upon our surrender to this idea that we are all connected, whether we would like to be or not. And perhaps, Monbe continues, this is the most important thing that rewilding offers us, the most important thing that's missing from our lives, hope. In motivating people to love and defend the natural world, an ounce of hope is worth a ton of despair. Still standing in a circle this morning, around the words that Jesus speaks, we are reminded that in times of darkness, God's presence and power is a light switch we reach for again and again to determine how it is we are called to see the world. This light may not change the past nor prevent the future, but it allows us to live with an awareness of who our Messiah is and to behave from a place of humility for how this understanding saves us from falling into the abyss of despair when we simultaneously mourn the victims of the last school shooting while wondering which tragedy will be announced next. Of course, this is a peculiar message to wander around in with raw and broken souls. Jesus and the Father are one. Jesus is one with his sheep. We are one with Jesus. And so, too, are we one with the Father through our unity with Christ. If we are to hear the voice of the Messiah, we are to understand that the wolf Jesus offers protection from is not the deviant living next door to us, but the divider living inside of us. The threat is not the terrorist, but the terror that tears us away from identifying both the human and holy present in one another. It makes sense that people within the religious institutions of both yesterday and today would carry with them such a responsibility to and a loyalty for the possibility of deliverance that they would be blinded to the promise of reconciliation. The power to assign evil a name while crafting a job description markets an irresistible antidote for a society paralyzed by its presence in our lives. Regardless, of how sick we become from its ingestion. The fear of a wolf encounter keeps us faithful to a process poisonous to our hearts. The message for the Johannian community, for our community, points to the enduring saturation of evil by the pervasive presence of goodness. The comprehension of this message determines not the result of our circumstances, but our response to them. We are not called to label and annihilate evil, but to worship and witness the resurrection of love through the reintroduction of light to our landscapes. 
For it would be my hatred that for one that would dilute my love for all. To the visible and catastrophic hatred of another human being, I will respond with a love that shines so bright as to identify the shattered skeleton thrashing in the darkness to survive. I will not live in fear when it is the voice of Jesus I hear and the footsteps of the Messiah I follow. The shepherd herds us from a story that begins with a shooter and ends with a savior and is possible because of the reconciliation only the father can provide. It is not the pain of the story, but the finality of the outcome that we find ourselves saved from. And because I know the power and presence of God's grace in my life, I can understand finally that Jesus is not the presence that rescues, but the force that reconciles. For at any time, I alone, all by myself, can abandon another in fear or disgust or denial. So I have accepted that it is not my love, but the love of Jesus that in every lapse of my well-worn ability to love continues to hold close the worth and purpose for all of his children. And so too this morning, may we recommit our lives to the continuation of a call to work for the reconciliation, the rewilding of all created beings. Amen.